So welcome back, and thank you so much. That was, uh, that's great. Um, so uh, that was a great scene setter we had on our first panel. Um, probably not a lot of new news in the big picture, which is that Canada has uh, a lot of work to do uh, to raise our game when it comes to quality, affordability, um, uh, broadband networks, and of course, uh, how they get spread about the country. Uh, there's a whole lot of people who view reliance on traditional telcos and cable codes as not being sufficient. I'm going to tell one quick anecdote. I may have mentioned this last year. Uh, a fellow named Roy Brister, I once wrote about, he runs an insurance business, I think, down in Brockville. And um, 15 or 20 years ago, all he wanted to do was connect his rural offices in Cardinal Prescott, this is a small town, eastern Ontario, and he got an outrageous price from the local telco, happened to be Bell. So Roy, the insurance guy, literally did a do-it-yourself wireless network, climbed up on water towers, climbed up on telephone poles throughout the eastern Ontario and just detached his gear and created his own wireless network to connect up all his uh, offices. Uh, the telco is eventually shamed into, hmm, if he can do that, we can do that. But there's a guy that didn't rely on a traditional telco uh, for his probably wasn't even broadband, just a band. But there's a lot of folks, folks in, in this room, I'm sure, may have had that do-it-yourself approach. That's innovation, and so that's that what we're going to be talking about is the sort of innovative approaches to improving our digital infrastructure in our lives. Uh, in the report from CIRA and the Strategic Council that uh, Byron referred to in his opening remarks, it's, it's also in your kits, it mentions that nearly all of those surveyed agreed that low-cost, wholesale broadband internet is important for economic competitiveness well, most agree that broadband speeds are too slow uh, and access is too expensive. So this is where we're going to start with this uh, distinguished panel. What can we do to up our game? Are there innovative approaches uh, that involve technology, partnerships, uh, new ways of thinking about pricing, who knows what, uh, that uh, can help Canada and can help uh, Canada abroad? I'm going to quickly introduce all our panel and then I'm going to, uh, we'll start sort of in one by one, just so you know who's on stage here. Uh, listening and, and getting reaction. Kelly Days, immediately to my uh, left here, is the Vice President of CENGEN, Center for Gov no, you say? Right, Center for Excellence and Next Generation Networks. There we are, everybody just keeps calling it CENGEN, right? That's it, yes. Uh, and uh, Kelly has over 20 years experience in both technology companies and not-for-profit organizations. Scott Jamison is the Director of Operations uh, for the Optical Network Corporation at the City of Coquitlam, and I was just in Vancouver on the weekend. The weather's here is much better, I think, isn't it? It's much. Yeah, I was at a scout camp on Saturday, and it, it was, was cold. Yeah, it 14. was very. Uh, there was a window of dry weather, which we did do a hike, so it was good. There we are, all the way from Coquitlam. So thank you, Scott, for joining us here. Mark Dupuy is the director of policy for OneWeb, uh, and uh, that's uh, next generation low Earth orbit satellites, broadband delivery. Mark is responsible for policy development, regulatory functions, and engagements with governments. Sam Rabiche is uh, founder and CEO of Ice Wireless, uh, an innovator in the satellite and fixed delivery in rural and remote areas. Sam oversees global and domestic strategies for both IrisTel and Ice Wireless to ensure business objectives are in line with uh, telecom needs. And uh, way at the end there is Chris Tassett. Chris, not, Chris is not going to do a lot of talking at the panel, but he's going to summarize things at the end. Chris is uh, um, with the Internet Society of Canada, but also has over 30 years of technical business and legal experience. He's the founder of Tacit Law. That's a, a law firm that provides uh, a broad range of legal and consulting services to clients in the information tech, uh, communications, regulated industries, broader commercial and not-for-profit uh, sectors. So uh, Chris is, uh, he helped put this panel together for one thing, and he's uh, going to be taking notes and and uh, summarize things for me at the end. So great panel from all sorts of, uh, all sorts of angles to get us started on this. Mm -hmm. Let's start with Kelly. Next generation networks, I know what they meant 20 years ago, 10 years ago, two years ago. What is a next generation network now and uh, why are they important? Oh, there's my slides. Um, okay, thank you very much for having me. It's my first time at the Internet Forum, so I'm really pleased to be here. Uh, apologize for the name Senjin. Uh, you'll see shortly we are a consortium and trying to get consensus on a name can prove difficult. Um, so I've prepared a few slides to try to answer your question. So what we're seeing in the industry is huge disruption. So service providers cannot use their traditional networks to transfer the huge amounts of data that we are seeing video, um, IOT, M2M, creating huge, huge challenges for them. 
So they're looking at ways to both monetize their network, decrease the complexity so they're full of multi-vendor equipment, um, and, and find cost savings and be able to be agile and scalable. Mm -hmm. Your hair looks great, but we're hearing it hit your microphone. Can you give a big toss and put it on the go. shoulder? There we go. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, so two areas that they're looking to transform their networks in are, are something called software-defined networking, which basically is when you remove the control plane from some of that equipment and you run it in the data center um, at the data plane level, right? So allowing them to get more control and scalability of their networks. Uh, the second term that you might hear when you're dealing with Sengen is network function virtualization. So basically what that is is they're trying to take the traditional equipment and, and virtualize it and run it in the data center environment. So if you're an equipment maker, this is a huge disruption, taking kind of your, your IP out of the uh, equipment and looking at you know, open uh, hardware and software in the environment. So huge, huge disruption. So if you're seeing the quote that I'm seeing in front of me, um, when we first started Sengen, uh, SDN, NFV were kind of pie in the sky ideas, but huge companies like AT&T are basically saying that by 2020, 90% of their network is gonna be software defined. So what is Sengen? So we are a not-for-profit. We're funded in part by the National Center of Excellence. Um, the rest of our funding comes from our members, so I think you'd recognize a few of these guys. So three of Canada's largest service providers, Allstream, uh, Telus, and Rogers. You'll see uh, fierce competitors, Cisco, Juniper, um, Nokia. So this was, the sponsor was originally the Alcatel-Lucent group here in Ottawa, but now Nokia. Uh, Wind River, uh, test and equipment vendors, Viavi Expo. Uh, basically, we've come together to try to do a couple of things. The vision of Sengen is to create, for Canada to be a world global leader again in networking, right? So there's no question when Nortel diminished, we lost some of that glow. The second one is to create an environment where SMEs can actually commercialize faster and do it better um, and give the members line of sight to that innovation uh, and create a talent pool. So what we're seeing coming out of universities they do not have the uh, skill sets to be able to run these next generation networks, which I'm gonna talk about in a second. Uh, we think our commercialization model is rather unique. So basically what we do is we take um, our members' challenges and problems, and we go across Canada with our other partners and say, do you have a solution, All right? So submit that as a project. Uh, our members then look at that, and uh, the goal is that they'll actually do an activity with that small or medium-sized company, right? So do a proof of concept, maybe become a reference client, um, do something to help them sell abroad. It's really hard to go sell to AT&T or Verizon or whoever your customer might be when no one in Canada is using your product, right? So uh, we put venture partners in front of the companies, and, and we basically create a funnel of innovation uh, in Canada. And we also have uh, the other key component here is, is we, do, uh, we do live what we sell. Uh, we take anywhere from 10 to 16 interns uh, a term. Inside of SunGen, we train the heck out of them. They stand up OpenStack. They train in ODL and some of the other controller technologies. And then they work on industry problems. So the goal at the end of that time is that industry will hire them. And so far, for students looking to be hired, we're 100%. And again, I, I didn't mention, we're about 22 full-time people, so having half of, more than half of that be students is, is definitely a challenge. So what have we done as one of the tools um, in Next Generation Networking? So we run an OpenStack production environment in our data center in Canada. We are absolutely national, but we, our headquarters is here in, uh, in the telecom park in Canada. We have a dark fiber connection down to the Canary Network, bringing uh, immediately online all of the academics and research network networks across Canada, and currently two uh, 100 gig connections from TELUS. So we're pretty well connected. Uh, we're looking at extending that WAN capability across Ottawa, and I'll talk in a minute about the future plans as well. Um, so we use this environment uh, to do proof of concepts, right? So between our members, interoperability, between members of SMEs, SMEs wanting to do uh, references and show clients that their product actually works. So in terms of industry, this is quite uh, a differentiator for Sengena for Canada, uh, this ability to have a live WAN to test the products on. Uh, we're looking, uh, we currently have a couple of applications in to extend this data center and WAN capability across Canada. It would be completely SDN controlled, open, programmable, and utilize the existing infrastructure um, of both our members and other organizations out there, such as Canary. 
Um, the idea would be that if you have one common piece of infrastructure, you could run multiple test beds on top of it, have one group organizing and running proof of concepts um, on top of that test bed, and wouldn't you get some cool innovation in between the different test beds? So how can public safety be running without talking to smart city? How can 5G be running without talking to connected vehicles? So the idea would be to get some of that innovation going um, amongst the different test beds in a unified way. Uh, just a quick highlight, I know I only had five, five to seven minutes. So um, we've been in, uh, we've been in a not-for-profit, we've been set up for about two and a half years. This is not trivial stuff. This truly, this truly is rocket science of networking that we're doing. Um, but last year we managed to execute our first six projects and they're on here. And these are the projects that we've queued up for this year's. Great. Oh, and one blatant promotional activity. We're doing our first summit this year on December 1st, and it'll be at the Brook Street in Canada. Excellent. Thank you very much, Kelly. That's great. Uh, Scott Jameson, as I mentioned, is, uh, is from Coquitlam. That's a city of about 125,000 people. Did I get that right? About right? Uh, 100. 144, actually. 144. It's grown since I last looked it up. Okay. So it's a mid-sized city and uh, with a municipal broadband network. So give us uh, your thoughts, Scott, on the experience of how Coquitlam came to the idea that this was important for your city. Um, well, I'll first explain what Coquitlam Optical Network Corporation is. We call it QNET. It's basically a municipal corporation, has a board of directors, and it's a for-profit with a social conscience. Uh, I don't know if anyone's heard of that before, but <laughs> maybe not in Canada in, in telecom. It's but. a PC thing, apparently. Yeah, it's a, it's a West Coast thing. Um, and that was in uh, 2008, and it's actually um, commercially successful. Uh, that's what it looks like. Uh, basically, the, uh, the lines are fiber. I, you would have assumed that, I suppose. It's all underground. It's all high-count fiber. And uh, it is uh, connected to the square dots, and obviously there's a lot more connections that we'd like to do. Um, those are the round dots, and the different colors are the different stakeholders. Obviously, we have our own internal requirements, the uh, ICT sites, and we have commercial sites, which are the purple sites, and we have uh, some uh, schools connected as well, and that's actually pretty cool. Um, basically, the value proposition is very simple. Uh, the city is uh, used to doing capital, large capital investments and having a, a long-term ROI. Uh, so it's uh, a, a way to build the infrastructure and, um, and not need to get your ROI in three years. Um, it's underground infrastructure, which uh, cities are good at because, well, when you turn the tap, the water runs. So uh, we're good at that. And uh, the concept was uh, there's only really one little piece of the network that the competitive telecommunication carriers need, which is that six micrometer germanium doped piece of glass that connects from A to B. And so uh, we make that available to uh, competitive carriers. And I think it's interesting to note that um, uh, incumbent uh, phone companies are... Um, trying to stop that from happening with the CRTC uh, wireline access uh, proceedings right now. So this is still relevant today. Um, and of course, what does that mean? Well, if you've uh, got more than two uh, providers, which we, <laughs> we had in 2008, and now we've got like a dozen, uh, you get uh, more products and um, lower prices. And uh, the city saves a few hundred grand a year just on our own telecom costs. Um, but it wasn't easy. In 2008, uh, you started talking about muni fiber, and people looked at you like you had two heads. Um, and of course, what makes it attractive is that it has reach, right? Someone asked for a private line circuit between this business and Canada. Well, we can't do anything about that because we just least dark fiber from a business in Coquitlam to another business in Coquitlam, right? So you can't get a lot of customers if you have a small network. And uh, since we're just doing dark fiber, there's not a lot of customers of dark fiber, right? 
People say, I want an internet circuit, and we say, I can't help you. So that's how we started. On the, at the scout camp, my daughter, five years old, she came to me with a slug. She's like, look, a slug, it's not eating. It's because you're poking it in the face. <laughs> so um, you saw the map. It's, um, it's doing well. It's generating revenue. It's uh, profitable. It's growing at 20% intrinsic. I say intrinsic because um, uh, sometimes uh, I make one-time sales, uh, like uh, we have a, a rapid transit system and we're, they were digging a tunnel and the tunnel was flooding. So I called up the guys at SNC-Lavalin and I said, do you want fiber between the part that's working and the part that's uh, not connected? And they said, sure, we need 46 strands. I said, pardon? So our actual growth in revenue last year was 27%, and our actual growth in revenue this year will be at least 49%. But I don't count that. Um, and of course, what makes it useful is that it's connected by, you know, to the world, uh, by Shaw, Telus, and uh, Zale. Hey, Allstream Zale. Um, and others that are uh, connected with IRUs, which are indefeasible right of use agreements on fiber and wavelengths. And the proof that it's a value proposition is, of course, that someone that could build their own network chooses not to, like Novus, Urban, and Rogers. And the result of it is that you get a gig synchronous for 79 bucks a month, which I'm told is a good deal. <laughs> and that's my presentation. Okay. Yep. Reason to move to Coquitlam, perhaps. Excellent. Except for the weather, or last weekend's weather, anyhow. Um, it's sunny now. Mark Dupuy, uh, satellites uh, you know, are going to be part of the mix. They are part of the mix already. Um, anywhere, availability, but there's technical issues. There's some price issues. Tell us a bit about OneWeb um, and what you guys are doing in the space. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Bonjour à tous. Uh, S'il y a des questions en français, ça me ferait plaisir de répondre en français. Mais évidemment, mon, ma présentation sera surtout en anglais. So, uh, OneWeb. What's OneWeb? OneWeb is a startup company. It was founded in 2012 by our now founder and chairman, uh, Mr. Greg Weiler. Greg is a pioneer in the satellite industry because he actually uh, used to operate cell towers and other telecommunications facilities in Africa and found that the only way to get backhaul was through geostationary satellites. And as I'll show you in my presentation, geostationary satellites are, are great. They're great for providing you video and things like that. When it comes to two-way, there's an issue called latency that surprisingly no one talked about this morning, and very few people talk about. But I will, I'll spend a bit more time talking about it. So he really didn't like the geo latency. So for him to serve the rest of the world, uh, where he was in Africa, uh, he thought a, a, a much lower orbit satellite was ne necessary. So he developed something called O3B, which is now operating, uh, making profit, sold it to SES, the biggest satellite company in the world, and has moved on and said, OK, what can I do now for the end user? Uh, O3B was great for bringing backhaul to large telcos. What can I do to the end user? And I like this, this, uh, uh, that, that uh, uh, expression you used before, a for-profit company with a social conscience. And we like to think of OneWeb a little bit like that as well. Uh, uh, Greg's prime motivator was bringing the internet to every single school in the world. And that is not a small goal. And if you look at today, over half of the world does not have an internet connection. So how do you get these people to be connected? And of course, most of the problems you'll realize based on this chart is in developing countries. Ooh, that came out really bad. All right, <laughs> apologize for that. This slide actually has five different criteria on it. I'm not sure what happened in the, uh, in the slide deck. But um, when we talk about broadband, as I mentioned just a few minutes ago, everybody talks about speed. Speed is a bit of a misnomer because it's not how fast the bits travel. That, that's a different story. Speed, we call about you know, how many megabits per second upload, how many megabits per second download. Very important. We've also heard also uh, before about volume, because if I give you a connection at 100 megabits per second, but your basic package is one gigabyte per month, you're going to use that in about half a day, assuming, of course, you like to spend time on the internet. Uh, and so in order to get something that's worthwhile in terms of speed, you need capacity. And that has been one of the fundamental problems of radio technologies. Fiber, you get 
almost as many capacity as you like, no problem. There's so much capacity on it. But when you come to radio services, and we talked about LTE this morning, LTE, there's just so much facility available. It can use fantastic speed. They can build you an LTE network or a 5G network that will give you 100 megabits per second to your phone, no problem, in a couple of years. But if they only give you, again, a very small capacity, because to give you more capacity, to give each one of us capacity, they have to build more and more infrastructure. It's very expensive. So volume, number of gigabytes per month, very important as well. And if you could kind of go down that slide, you would eventually get to something that I think is the most, well, as important as anything else, which is latency. And I'll give you an example of what latency is all about. Uh, wrapping all of this slide would be cost. Because again, it has to be affordable. So we talked about affordability. We talk about data rates and speed. Latency has to be mentioned in there as well. And last but not least, of course, uh, the volume. How much can you consume? So this is the traditional satellite world. We call it the geostationary belt. And we call it a belt because it's one small ring around the world, 40,000 kilometers above Earth. And that's where the majority of communication satellites operate today. There's a few exceptions, but the great majority today, if you're watching Bell TV or you're watching Shaw Direct, or if you're doing internet in Nunavut, you're going through a geostationary satellite. And so geostationary satellites have been fantastic. They've been opening up Canada like nothing else have done it before. You cannot bring fiber to a community of 200 people, which is 2,000 kilometers from anywhere else. It's just not economically feasible. Therefore, satellites have filled that gap. They've done it very, very well. But the problem is that 36,000 kilometers, a return trip for a packet, so to go from the user to the internet and back to the user, is half a second or more. It's half a second just over air time, just to get over the space that you need to get there, plus another probably 100 or 200 milliseconds to get through the internet, through all of the switches. So that is a very long time. You saw this morning how we kind of had to wait for uh, uh, the OECD to get the information before she could respond. Well, this was somewhat artificial delay perhaps, it was the way that things were set up. But on the GeoLink, you will always have a minimum half second round trip delay. And what can be a bit annoying in a voice call, imagine if you're doing real time critical operations. I would not want to be the person that's being operated by a Toronto surgeon in Timbuktu, Canada, if the surgeon saw what he's doing to me half a second after the knife has actually cut through my spleen. So, okay, pretty extreme example. Let me give an example that's maybe a bit more practical. Cloud computing. When you take all of your software and you move it off of your computer desktop and put it in the cloud, and every time you're doing anything on that software, you're transacting packets to and from the cloud, and every packet takes a half second delay, you can imagine that your cloud solution will not work. So what have we come up with? Well, first of all, we kind of shrunk the earth. I apologize about that. We kind of made it an egg. That's just a, because I think my presentation is in 16 by 9 format, so apologize <laughs> for that. But the Earth being round, you can see our satellites are much, much closer, 1,200 kilometers altitude. So the round trip delay now from the user to the internet and back to the user, just air time alone, is less than 30 milliseconds. Counting all of the internet delays, we're probably less than 50 milliseconds. So my founder uh, during the CRTC hearing had a very good example. I thought it was really cool, so if you allow me, I'll just take two seconds and mention it. He said, imagine the person sitting on a 36th floor apartment turns on the hot water, and the hot water is in a boiler in the basement, and they have to wait a few seconds before the water gets hot. And they talk to their neighbors on the first floor, and they say, do you have problems with hot water? The neighbor on the first floor says, no, it's instantaneous. I turn it on, it's, it's there. I have to wait a few seconds. I'll get the plumber to put a bigger pipe. So the plumber comes in the next day and puts in a two-inch two pipe directly to the 36th floor. Next morning, the person, the lady's trying to take a shower, so she turns on the hot water. She gets gallons and gallons of water, but it's still cold. It still takes a few seconds for the water to get hot. Why? You made the pipe bigger, but you did not s slow down the latency between the first floor and the 36th floor. This is what OneWeb, in an example, will do. We'll reduce that time it takes to get your packets from the user to the internet. So to do this, though, with low urban satellites, in order to have full Earth coverage, you need lots of satellites. Every one of those little white dots on the screen is one of our satellites. And so what does it look like? Well, by 2020, when we expect to launch commercial services, we will have 648 satellites circling the globe uh, at all time. From day one of commercial service, we can provide service to the entire globe, not just 
you know, parts of Canada, we will not cherry pick Ottawa or Toronto or Los Angeles, the entire globe will be covered from day one. We can actually upgrade the service if we run out of capacity by just launching more satellites. And contrary to the predecessor geostationary satellites, which typically cost 50, 100, or 200 million dollars a piece, we are now forming a joint, we have formed a joint venture with Airbus to build the satellites at less than $1 million each. So it's a two orders of magnitude lower cost than what you've seen traditionally. Why? Because we are building the dumbest, simplest satellites possible. We are making it just what we call a bent pipe. Whatever satellite sees, the satellite retransmits. Very simple technology, nothing super novel. We're putting the smarts on the ground, not on the satellites. So that is the, as the technology evolves, we can evolve the ground segment. We do not have to launch brand new satellites, but we can keep launching replacement satellites. Um, we will be operating a little bit like the internet. You have network redundancy. The traditional geostationary satellites have to have a lot of really high reliability because you launch one or two. If you lose one satellite, you've lost half your network. In the case of OneWeb, we're launching several hundred satellites. You lose a few, you replace a few. You move some of the satellites around, you fill the nodes you replace the communication link, just like the internet does today. If you lose a site on the internet today, you have 10 other routings by which you can get to Google, Amazon, or Facebook. It's low Earth orbit, I mentioned that. The 648 comes from 18 orbital planes. Those are the vertical, because the satellites are flying in the north-south direction, and 36 or more satellites per plane. We expect to be able to serve four to five million subscribers. What we call a subscriber is a satellite terminal. So that satellite terminal can be providing service to one person, to a group of people, or to a community. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. So four to five million terminals. And for those of you that like spectrum stuff, and I didn't think this was really a spectrum group, uh, we operate our service links, the user links, in what we call the KU band, the 1412 gigahertz band, and the KA band in the 3020 gigahertz band. So if you want more on that, there's a few slides I think that will be available on the website later on. My coordinates will be there. You just give me a shout, an email, a call. I'll talk to you about that. The last point I wanted to raise is if you're in the north of Canada, if you look, for example, in uh, Nunavut, your earth stations have to point very far close to the ground, very low elevation angle, because they have to see that satellite that's at 36,000 kilometers over the equator. With OneWeb, we will have satellites that are always flying overhead. So all of our terminals will operate with a minimum elevation angle of 45 degrees. So it actually looks only at the sky above. So no blockage from trees, no blockage from terrain, no blockage from somebody else's house or apartment building across the street. So what kind of communication services? We're targeting today 50 megabits per second download speed for, per terminal. Now that, of course, is a function of, like any radio solution, how many users are simultaneously using but we can pretty much guarantee quality of service at about 50 megabits per second per terminal based on our projected deployment. The round trip latency that I mentioned is so important, 50 milliseconds to and fro. And we can actually be a backhaul to the cellular community. So we're not trying to compete with these guys. We're not trying to compete against Bell and TELUS. We are trying to be an infrastructure provider that anybody can use, a bit like the city of Quat I'm not even going to say the word, I'm going to screw up. So the city next to me has just mentioned. And so uh, we're trying to provide infrastructure for others to provide service to the end users. We're not an, an end user company, we are a wholesaler. So three different types of market. The satellite broadband, it could be residential. So you can actually have a one web terminal right on your farmhouse if you're in the middle of nowhere and nobody else will want to serve you. It could be a community, community access point. So imagine a small town in Novot, maybe with 120 people. We may provide the facilities by which we can backhaul to the internet in the south. And then, of course, some local provider like ICE Wireless, SSI, or Northwest Dell, or anybody else can actually provide the ground infrastructure to serve the 120 uh, residences and small business. Or we can actually provide business to business, corporate type enterprise. So these are all kind of direct to what we call a consumer, direct to uh, premises. The second market, which is a really big market for us as well, is cell backhaul. So you can imagine today, we have about something like 5,000 cell sites in Canada. With 5G, it is projected that we will have at least 10 times as much, because the cells will be so much smaller, they'll be much uh, more cell sites. Now, if you happen to be close to a fiber node, no problem, you connect your cell site to the fiber and you're off and running. If you're not too far away, you might be able to do a short microwave backhaul. But if your cell site is hard to reach, we can provide that solution. 
Why? Because we're completely transparent to the user. We don't add that half second delay. Whatever application runs on your network can be backhauled on a one web satellite. And last but not least, the, so some of the enterprise markets, and I'm almost done. Uh, example, cruise ships. We already have uh, progressed quite a bit with some of the major cruise lines in terms of providing services to their ships. Today, they have to use basically Mr. Weiler's previous company, O3B, or Geo Satellites. And again, they suffer the same latency issues, although O3B is much better than the Geos, but still quite a bit. We are looking at some of the uh, public protection disaster relief. If you look at, for example, um, uh, uh, Public Safety Canada would like to build a Canadian public safety broadband network. Well, they're not going to replicate the entire cellular network. That would not make a lot of sense economically. So they'll use, of course, some of the networks, I'm sure, from Bell, Telus, and Rogers. But they would like to have 100% Canadian coverage. With our solution, they can actually put a terminal on a, any truck, fire truck or police vehicle, and have local connectivity, because each of our terminals will have cellular and Wi-Fi backhaul built in. And you can do this on planes, ships, trains, everything. We are very uh, fortunate to have a very committed, very strong um, uh, uh, round A, if I can call it that, series of shareholders. So Airbus and Qualcomm were the first two initial shareholders uh, that uh, invested in, in, uh, in OneWeb. Airbus is actually in a joint venture with our company, and we formed a new company that's building, that will be building satellites in Florida. In the meantime, the first prototype satellites will be built out of Airbus facility in France. Qualcomm is doing the chip design that will go in all the terminals. And Qualcomm, you probably know, is the premier company that provides all the chipsets for like 90% of cell phones around the world. So we are building that same cell technology in each of our, our terminals. Uh, Hughes, a very well-known manufacturer of satellite equipment. Intelsat, a satellite service provider who actually operates and owns geos. They are an investor in OneWeb because they can see the hybrid capability of their geo satellites for pushing content and one web to do the two-way transactional stuff. MDA, Canadian company, McDonald-Weiler out of uh, BC, who's building the antennas and designing other parts of the networks. Virgin Group in the UK uh, will also provide launch services uh, to us. And uh, a couple of companies I want to mention, Barty and Salinas, they're both operators in, their, in, in very large markets. So Barty is out of India, operating across the sub-Indian continent as well as Africa. And Salinas is based out of Mexico, providing cellular type and communication services across the Americas. So we already have all of the various pillars, whether it's from people building equipment, people uh, providing wholesale services, and people providing retail services, all reinvestors. And right now, our CEO and CFO are doing the world tour in order to go to second round or round B of financing. Last but not least, the sort of oddball in there, Coca-Cola. You might want to wonder, why would Coca-Cola invest into a telecoms company? Uh, you'd be surprised that Coca-Cola, or you might not be surprised, that Coca-Cola has probably one of the world's biggest distribution networks because they have to replen replenish all of those stores, those kiosks, those little vending machines in 180 countries. And so they see the potential of OneWeb to provide those kiosks with connectivity. So you're in the middle of nowhere in Africa, you go buy yourself a Coke and spend a few minutes on the internet for one low, low cost. That's my presentation. Uh, as I said, there's a lot more that will be available on the website. Thank you very much for listening to me. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Mark. That is pretty interesting. Um, Sam and I were talking before this got going. I was in Inuvik uh, two, two or three years ago as a reporter covering Prime Minister Stephen Harper's annual Arctic trip. And uh, those who know the Prime Minister, the former Prime Minister, a bit, a bit of a button-down fellow, to put it mildly. And uh, in Inuvik, uh, he ended up doing a native polar bear dance. This is Stephen Harper, and a few journalists are all watching, unbelievable, we go, this is going to be a big hit when we get it back on our websites. And we videotaped it, uh, and then we tried to get video, six reporters all competing out of Inuvik, and uh, it took about 12 or 14 hours for two minutes of video that we knew you wanted to see of Prime Minister Stephen Harper with polar bear claws doing a dance. So that's the setup. Sam, you've been doing this for 17 years in uh, Ice Wireless. I know, uh, Sam, tell us about uh, the biz and your success. In, making sure you can see videos of Stephen Harper faster from Inuvik. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, Ice Wireless started uh, about, uh, uh, since 99 actually, 17 years ago. And uh, we, we are deploying, uh, we're a mobile uh, network operator, uh, deploying uh, networks in, in the three territories. We have uh, license spectrum 
in, uh, in the Yukon, in Northwest Territories, and in Nunavut, uh, operating on the 850 and the 1900 megahertz. Um, uh, we've uh, partnered up with Iris Tel. I, I founded Iris Tel seven, uh, well, 17 years ago, back in 99 as well. And uh, collectively, the two companies have uh, done some really innovative things in, in the Canadian market that uh, uh, were uh, hard to, uh, I guess, get anybody to, to move on. And uh, it's true when they say that uh, necessity is the mother of all invention. It seems like everybody on the panel here had to go innovate so that we could uh, deal with the pain points that we go through uh, every day. Um, so we cover about 70% of the population in, in Canada's Arctic uh, as of today. We're expanding coverage. We're deploying our LTE network uh, by the end of this year. We're rolling it out in a, in a few sites. Uh, we're running an HSPA plus network right now uh, across, uh, across the three territories. Uh, in some of the places in Nunavut, we were the first 3G mobile operator. Uh, the incumbent there wasn't moving. As soon as we launched our network, they basically came in uh, probably two months after us. Um, so just to give you a landscape of the, uh, the MNO, the mobile network operators in Canada, it's, uh, it's a very select few uh, that are part of this club, and uh, it's, it's a shrinking club, and there's probably a lot of reasons why. Uh, and Verena earlier on mentioned in the slide that you know, Canada is lagging behind on the mobile broadband penetration. Uh, there's many reasons, and I'm sure there will be another panel that will be geared towards it, but definitely we lack, we lack uh, com competition in, in that space here for you know, whether it's spectrum allocation, the, uh, how, how things are given away, and, and who, who keeps bidding on it and squatting on, on that spectrum. Um, so there's our coverage map. It's probably, I'm not sure if it's very visible here. But we span, as I mentioned, the, the three territories all the way up, so coast to coast, to coast, all the way up to Taktiaktak. Um, and uh, that, that's, that's the operating area that, that, we're, that we're in. So the success factors uh, that, um, you know, rule, rule number one was that we had no rules to follow because all the equipment that, were, that was available to us was on a macro level, a traditional network operator that's deploying, uh, you know, a macro tower site, uh, things that would service maybe 20,000 people when we're in areas that are only 500, 1,000, maybe maximum in Whitehorse would be 20,000 that's, that's split over, uh, over the terrain. Uh, so we had to really uh, break the mold and, and figure out new ways. And, and one of the, there's three main factors that, that were the, you know, driving success, um, behind ICE Wireless, which is the scalability, the flexibility, and the cost. Um, the scalability is basically, we started going on a, on a micro level deployment, so everything was a small scale, distributed architecture. Uh, everything is IP based, so every cell phone call that you make through your iPhone or your smartphone actually goes as a SIP call back to um, our IP based network and it gets compressed uh, you know, with, with HD audio, so you're not, you, you couldn't tell the difference, and we're able to, uh, to deploy speeds uh, that, that are much higher uh, in the region today than, than what people are accustomed to. Uh, now, no Northwest Dell is, is, is obviously uh, upgrading their networks, but the biggest problem that we have in rural Canada is really the backhaul. Um, one of the things, uh, the studies that Qualcomm did, uh, uh, network technologies have a lifespan of about 18 years. 10 years into that network adoption cycle, there's a newer technology that rolls out. If that holds true, that means that we're a few years away from um, the next uh, wireless evolution, and we're even further away from it being uh, widely adopted. So uh, the flexibility, uh, we've deployed uh, equipment that's on a backpack, and I'll show you on a later slide. Uh, we've done some stuff for the uh, Canadian military. Uh, and cost, everything now is in a virtualized environment, so one server could literally run an entire core for us, and that means less power. Power is very expensive in the north, and in some places we have to run diesel generators on top of a mountain that somebody literally has to go up and refill every six months or you know, uh, 
So it's very harsh terrain that, that we're dealing with uh, up in northern Canada. Uh, the remote monitoring and control tools that we have, so everything has to be fully uh, automated in the sense we can't rely on, on manpower to be dispatched when there's a snowstorm and something goes wrong. Uh, or, so everything is, is built in a redundant manner. We've used uh, sea cans that we've actually customized to, to heat, to insulate, to, uh, uh, to, to put cameras on lights at servers, to uh, you know, reboot equipment, uh, monitor temperature, humidity, uh, all, all that good stuff. Here's some network photos. I thought it'd be interesting just to see um, some of the stuff here. And um, so these are all across the, the Arctic. Um, one that's of interest that David mentioned earlier. So there's that on the upper left corner is our uh, office in Inuvik. Uh, so Inuvik is in the Arctic Circle, and that dome that you see is actually uh, a dew dome, which stands for Distant Early Warning. And what that was, it was um, an initiative by the, uh, the U.S. government to deploy these on the, uh, uh, mainly the Canadian Arctic and in Alaska and Greenland, Iceland, and uh, it was to um, notify in case a Russian bomber would come during the Cold War. So this was built in the, in the mid-50s, basically. We were able to get our hands on one, and we made it our office in, in the north. And it actually serves as a good cooling, heating, airflow with the data center moving the, uh, the temperatures. Actually, reduce our electricity bill, too, up there. Um, so just some more photos there. And uh, we, we own, uh, so everything, one thing that we've learned not to do is rely on the incumbent. Um, we had to be very agile and, and uh, quick to deploy whatever we needed to deploy. Uh, so we've decided to build our own towers, our own infrastructure. Uh, we, we don't do, um, you know, we tried to go and, and use a tower sharing schema. That didn't work. Uh, if we wanted to modify something, it would have been impossible to do. So we've decided to actually take it upon ourselves to do it from scratch and uh, literally just do rooftop deployments, more, more of a, a micro you know, if we couldn't get something done on the macro level, we, we, we prefer the, the, the micro approach in, in, in northern Canada. Uh, on the satellite side for, um, so some of the, the transport networks here, just the customized solutions that we've done. This is the, uh, the Canadian military uh, Nanook uh, project that we did. We, we were able to deploy a full 3G node in a backpack size uh, that they could take and, and connect to a cellular station um, and, and be able to communicate back and forth. Uh, one of the, the biggest hurdles, obviously, we have, uh, as Mark mentioned, is the uh, low Earth orbit versus geostationary. So all the, uh, there, there is no fiber in a lot of these places. There's no even microwave. It's all literally satellite uh, connectivity. And the latency, so what, when we interconnect to Northwest Tel, for example, on the CLEC side, so Irostel is a CLEC that covers, we're actually the only CLEC operating in, in, in uh, northern Canada. Uh, and, and in order to peer there on their switches, some of the calls actually end up sometimes making it back to the south and to the north because uh, just the way the routing happens and, and, um, and some of the, you know, how Bell owns some of the Northwest Tel switches. Um, so it, it makes it sometimes a high latency call to call from one community to another, and there's no way around it. Um, so there's definitely going to be a need for more on the backhaul side. Uh, for rural Canada, we don't really have a problem with last mile. It's really on the backhaul that that's that's the issue. Uh, and and the last mile is more of a deployment logistical nightmare because you got to plan ahead with um, you know weather, ship your containers before the everything freezes up, and and, and getting people on on towers and, and rooftops to, to get things done. So that's basically, uh, you know, the, the, the type of customers that we have and the uh, flexibility that we, we offer. And that's it. Okay, great presentation. Thank you, Samer. That's uh, neat stuff. Um, once again, we want to have your questions, thoughts, comments. So um, put your hand up, and uh, as I say, a, someone with a microphone will uh, arrive at your table. Just hold it up until the microphone gets there. Um, and while the microphone's traveling, I just want a quick run down the panel here. On this question, the federal government in its budget says it's going to spend $500 million over the next five years on broadband. broadband. 
where would you spend it? Um, and we'll go reverse order. So you, I've just given you all $500 million to spend on broadband. Uh, Mark's got his thumb up. I can see more satellites going up. Uh, Samer, where would you spend $500 million if you had the chance? Um, definitely on, on a, on a uh, so it would be a staged approach that I would look at both the backhaul and the last mile. I think right now the, the last mile is, is definitely suffering as well because uh, a lot of the uh, kids in these communities actually have access to smartphones, believe it or not, but they're not able to connect to anything. So they're using it what, so that they can walk by that, you know, maybe someone's home that has a Wi-Fi running on an Explore net, which is slow. And uh, uh, so, so I would actually do it both ways, one on the uh, constellation of some sort for a low Earth orbit, mm -hmm. the geostationary method would not, would, would not work, and, uh, and giving spectrum away to people that can actually leverage it to deploy uh, you know, an LTE uh, network, uh, which will eventually go towards, um, uh, it'll, be, it'll be 5G ready, let's say, in one day. All right, Mark, how about you? 500 million bucks, where's it go? Yeah, for us, uh, I think we think the solution, and by, by the way, I think the government is actually starting this dialogue. Uh, I'm actually attending a panel tomorrow. To, oh, good. To, well, so good. what I'm about to say is maybe a, a pre preempting what I'm going to say tomorrow, but uh, our thinking is more like it's always been community by community. Let's go fix this little problem, fix that little problem. For us, would be uh, the idea would be go ahead, Government of Canada, tell us the 50,000 households that are most difficult to connect I don't care which one, just say, we have a program here, give us a price to connect those 50,000 households, and here are the criteria, mm -hmm. you know, certain minimum speed, certain this, certain that, the cost to the user has to be no more than so much, and let the industry bid for it. Uh, but right now, it's always been, you know, well, let's go serve that little community here because right now it's unserved. Um, we view it as, it should not be, it should be community agnostic, just say, you know, I'm going to give you so much money in order to make sure the connectivity is there, but you don't get to pick the house. The government gets to pick the house. And so we think a bid like that would go a long ways, and we'd be, we'd be willing, ready, and able to deliver on this, as long as it's not next year, because our constellation, of course, won't be up until 2020. But uh, within four years, we think we have a solution that can serve a lot of people in Canada. And others will also. We're not the only ones in this game. It's got a slight twist to you, because, of course, you may know, and many of you may know, that not only are we spending 500 million over five years on broadband, but we've got billions for municipal infrastructure in any event, and maybe municipal infrastructure ought to include fiber networks. I don't know, you got some thoughts on that? Well, I think it's, uh, it's more designed for rural and remote. That's kind of where they're targeting the, the money. The 500 so, million, yeah. So I'll, I, I'll just say that uh, BC has done pretty well on that so far. It's been a lot of um, projects uh, by WISPs and others uh, in rural and remote areas. Uh, I would just say that going forward, they really need to keep that up with um, a lot of, try and get a lot of stakeholders involved in the other side of that uh, money. Mm -hmm. And also just to, um, uh, to really just uh, make sure that it's uh, tracked, you know, that it's, it's controlled in terms of what they're, what they're actually getting for the money, because it's our money, right? right. So that's, that's what I would say. And I would also say that it should take into some account the topology. I mean, in Alberta, it is easier to deploy to more rural areas than it is in uh, the fjords of BC, right? So I, I would like to see some consideration for just how expensive it is to, to service that 100-person community in BC. Kelly, you got some thoughts on where $500 million ought to go? Yeah, so you can give that all to send, Jen. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Knew somebody was going to say that. Yeah. Uh, uh, I guess I'm coming at it from a bit of a different uh, approach. I'd like to see Canada do some firsts again, right? We had the first mobile network. I'd like to see us back on the map doing some of these innovations. So I guess I would suggest that some of it be spent on innovation and, and test beds, right? So one of the projects we're working on is a smart city project that I'm gonna to talk to you about after. Um, but basically taking one fiber and sharing it securely amongst numerous service providers using SDN and NFV, right? Innovation, that's I'd like to see us kind of lead again in some of these things. All right, we've got some questions. So we're going to start with uh, our online audience. Again, we've got some people plugging in online. And uh, here's one, and it's going to go to Samer. What are the barriers to tower sharing? 
Do you want to talk about that a little bit? You mentioned the incumbent a couple of times. Uh, we all think of who that might be. Um, Samer, go ahead. Well, what about tower sharing? Yeah, so before I just answer that question, just going back, it's, it's kind of related to the uh, open access uh, methodology and, uh, you know, with the 500 million or, you know, any, anything we're tower sharing. Part of the problem right now is you go to the incumbent and they say, well, we've got to do this engineering study on this one tower to see if you can mount one kilogram of equipment. And I'm thinking, okay, well, if this was a data center business and you go to a, somebody says, oh, I want like a 5U unit, are they going to tell you we need a whole engineering study for the power of the whole data center? I mean, they should already know that. And it's kind of a delay tactic that's very frustrating. Um, so the rules are not clear. And it kind of goes back to that open access. If there's $500 million or the spectrum that was given to the incumbents back in the day for free, you know, it, it kind of all relates to the same thing of us uh, uh, making sure the rules are clear and there's no uh, 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 play on, on, on dates because that's, it's, a, it's a delay tactic for everybody, right? So. All right, so uh, let's go to the, the room now. And uh, if you've got a question, please address it uh, to someone in the room. And introduce yourself, folks, too. It's a small group. I'd like to get you to know your name. Who's got a microphone? Who's got a, a right there or needs a microphone? There we go. It's table eight. Hi, uh, Marita Mall. I'm a director here at CIRA, uh, and I come from the civil society background uh, on uh, uh, connectivity issues. My question is to Scott. Uh, you have a municipally owned broadband network, right? Um, there, you're not the only one. There are others. It is a bit of a thing that's under the radar here in Canada. In the U.S., it's a really, really big deal. And the, and the, and the, and the president has actually come out with a statement saying, yes, we should be supporting municipally owned broadband networks. Um, could you tell us a little more? Uh, and it's great to hear what you people have been doing in Coquitlam. Uh, tell us a little more about what you know about what some of the other people out there have done and are doing because I'm sure that you all talk to each other. I've heard a number of really powerful and passionate presentations about the power of that model to support community economic development. Uh, well, that's a great question. Um, relatively speaking, there aren't a lot of examples in Canada. But I'll talk in generalities because I think those are more powerful. The uh, ability to deploy a network uh, in a municipality uh, is impacted, uh, and the success factors are, are pretty easy to understand. You've got some examples where the municipality owns the power utility, which means they own the poles. And that's really key. So they can actually build their network uh, like the incumbent for about that same sort of uh, cost base. And the, the difference is, of course, they're open access, so they'll allow the use of that network for the, the uh, other competitive telecommunications providers. So that's a key thing. If, if you don't have that, what you need is a municipality that actually has an engineering department, and I will single out the engineering department because it's always those guys, those old white guys that don't think about the three inch plastic pipe when they're spending $10 million putting in the water main. So if you can get yourself inserted in that process, it's a huge difference. And I've seen some of that, right? I've seen that and I just invite myself to the capital projects meetings. So I'm the guy that sits there and then I'm not on the agenda. And then I put my hand up and I say, hey, you're buying a video camera for that pump station, but uh, how are you going to connect it? Like, they'll, they'll buy the, because they get an engineer to design the pump station, right? And the engineer designs the pump station, it's got all the bells and whistles. But it doesn't have the wire to connect to the, the, so we, the city of Coquitlam has a bunch of video security monitoring systems that aren't connected because they never thought to actually put a fiber cable to it, right? So change the mindset of the engineering department in the municipality, the roads guys, Okay, change their mindset and you will be miles ahead. So we were lucky. When the traffic camera system was getting deployed, they said, let's put a pipe in. We don't know what kind of wire we're going to put in it, but let's put a pipe in. So they did, right? So, they, so that was a good thing that they did. And the other thing is backhaul, right? You, if you're old Alberta and you want to do this, you're going to fail, right? Because 
there's no connection to the cloud. There's no service. What are you going to do? So they set up their own uh, service provider because they had no choice, right? There was no one else to do it. We're lucky. We got those, we got Bell to connect to us and Allstream and Telus and Shaw. And so we have the world connected to our local access network. So that's a really key thing. And then examples. We are now the example in our region. So New West is starting up BridgeNet. They've got five million bucks and they're going. And they're gonna have a much, much easier time of it than we did because they don't have to sell the concept. They can just say, we're open for business. And Surrey is doing something on the infrastructure side. Burnaby wants to do this. So you have an example and then they point to the example and then you've got the customers that say, when is New West going to do it? Because we're already customers. We'll already pay. Just build it. So I'm a little jealous of that. But anyway, that's what I would say. Thank you. Great answer, Scott. All right. Do we have another question from the room? Right over here at table four. Thank you. Yeah, feel free to shout it out if I'm not looking your way. Bernard Couchman from Edge to Old Boy. The question is for the municipalities. Now, I live in Ottawa, West Nupian, and that, my backyard has uh, Nortel, but formerly Nortel. And I have a great idea. My idea is to, um, in the district of Ottawa, West Nupian, because it was a hotbed for technology, I want to turn that whole district and make it accessible to everybody in it, business and uh, regular citizens, to uh, have access to the internet, because a lot of people already don't have access to the internet there. So as a federal district, I'm trying to make it, rather than a municipality, I want to make it a district having access to that internet. Do you, um, do, you, uh, do you think that would be a good idea for a district or should I go through the municipality and, and rather than just one district have the old city? And also a follow up to the guy in the middle. Uh, a few years ago, Hollywood had a, what's called a traffic jam of satellites because too many satellites were uh, over, uh, I think it was the Oscars uh, one night. Do you foresee that in the future for you have how much? 625 satellites orbiting? Do you see traffic jams and how do you, how do you plan on removing those traffic, those bumper fender benders, uh, so to speak? All right, we'll start with Scott. Do you have a, uh, some advice perhaps maybe on those who might want to start a community owned or a city owned uh, fiber network? Usually there is a lead uh, organization and it depends on the topology. In BC, there are a lot of regional districts that are the, uh, the stakeholders. The Columbia Basin Trust is an example that's actually uh, basically a, an agglomeration of small communities uh, and it's handling that uh, enablement of the local access efforts in each of the communities but on a regional basis and it's a large area it's the East Kootenays and, and that kind of area so I would say the answer is there should there usually is a lead but I wouldn't rule out all of the stakeholders. Bring in the university network, bring in the regional district, bring in the, we have Metro Vancouver, it's like the, the regional, um, regional, government, essentially. regional government for transportation and utilities and stuff like that. Bring in as many stakeholders you can and bring in the private sector. Rogers is one of our biggest customers. They got bucks. They can build their own fiber, but they lease it from us. So don't be afraid of the incumbents. Don't be afraid of the cable codes. Talk to them. Before QNET started, they invited everybody and they said, here's what we're thinking of doing. What do you, what do you say? And being a public sector uh, agency, we have to be open. We have to be, we can't hide what we're doing. We publish our financial, you know, we, everything has to be open. So just right at the outset, just invite as many people as you can and tell them what you're thinking and get their feedback. And Mark, quickly on uh, traffic jams for yeah. 300 and some, or 600 and some odd. Well, yeah. there's two types of traffic jams, and I suspect, I don't know the incident that the gentleman was talking about, but I suspect it was an interference traffic jam. In other words, it's radio waves operating in the wrong frequency or in the wrong place, and you cause interference to each other. That's one type of traffic jam. But I think the part of your question for us was, what about the physical traffic jam? Yeah, launching and operating 648 satellites in low Earth orbit is a challenge, no doubt about it. We do a few things, for example, we have the orbital planes stacked slightly different in altitude so that when they cross, they don't crash into each other. And as far as end of life, because we will have satellites that will fail, we have satellites that will no longer be in use, the, they've been designed from the start, from the get-go, to deorbit. So the satellites will actually be brought down to Earth and, and burn out in the atmosphere. 
And that's already pre-planned, pre-controlled, so we will not leave space junk up there. Unless, of course, we lose complete control of one satellite, which can happen. But any satellite at the end of its useful life will be deorbited and burned. Okay, neat. We've got another question online, and this uh, actually, I'm actually going to put, it's, it's for Scott, but I'm also going to get Kelly to jump in on this uh, uh, as well. Uh, does, uh, whoop, there it is again, sorry, Scott. Um, does Scott use open source cloud networks to expand their local network, or is it a private network? Does that make sense? It actually doesn't apply. Uh, we lease a strand of glass in a cable mm -hmm. from the day, QNET owns a couple of data centers, which are a key element of all this. You need a place for your customers to connect to that local access fiber that goes to the building. So we lease a, a strand of glass, and we say it's on this port in the panel above your equipment in the rack that we are giving to you for free. And it goes to 123 Main Street into the telecommunications room, and it's port number three on the panel that's on the wall in, in that building. So we are 100% uh, private network in the sense that you get your own glass, mm -hmm. and uh, so it's 100%. And you do what you want with that. You glass. do what you want. It just so happens that we're placing 288 fibers when we uh, put a cable down. Uh, Kelly, I want to put the twist on this, because when I see the word open source in there, immediately I start thinking of some of the great fights at IETF meetings or whatever on standards, proprietary, et cetera. Um, Give me the State of the Union as far as, are, is everybody getting along so far as standards go, et cetera, et cetera? Well, well I'd actually, so, so I can answer that one for sure, but even just going back to this question that was for Scott, so um, in an effort to keep my talk down at the five minute mark, I didn't talk about the biggest project that we're working on, which is a smart city project. So community owned infrastructure controlled by SDN. So. What Scott's doing is, is awesome, and we'd love to work with him to take it to the next level. So basically what it does is the SDN allows you to slice that one fiber and use it on demand securely from multiple service providers. And we're taking it to the next level, and the tenants are the real winners, so they can, on their one point-to-point -point fiber in the community, they can order numerous services from numerous providers. So it would be the first of its type in the world. Um, we are talking to a community in Ottawa to roll this out as a pilot project. Very disruptive construction. People don't run data centers. They don't run uh, service providers. They don't bill service providers, but they're willing to take a chance and try to do something that's truly innovative. And love to talk to you more about um, our discussions with the city uh, because we do bring three of those largest service providers to the table. Um, I get asked probably that question the most. How about do our and well and, like and yeah. the coopetition amongst our members? So I would argue that probably this consortium couldn't happen anywhere else in the world than Canada. Uh, Juniper would not sit with Cisco. I would say probably uh, down in California. But together, um, in our consortium, they're working very collaboratively, and the projects run separate and secure, right? So. If they don't want to participate in a project with each other, they don't, right? And we run them separate. We keep the IP with the SMEs or the organization bringing it in. So we're kind of that trusted third party. Um, we don't really play on the policy area. Uh, there's some other groups in Canada that I think are much better placed to do that. So organizations like CWTA, um, CADA plays a large role in that, uh, CIRA somewhat. Um, so what we're trying to do is really focus on commercialization and innovation. All right, great, thank you. I'm just going to go one more, uh, just this question's been sitting here. I'm not sure who wants to try this, maybe for another panel this afternoon, but how does the .ca extension, the domain, help our Canadian economy and the end user? Anybody want to put their hand up and try that one? Anybody in the room want to try it, except who doesn't work for Sierra? Try it. Who wants to try it? Okay. Well, there, Byron's at the back of the room going, he knows how it's going to work. Okay, Byron, you want to give a quick answer to that Actually, one? I, sh I should let other people say no, what they go think ahead. on it's, this. It's your, it's your domain. You might as well defend it. Go ahead. <laughs> I mean, in terms of um, what I think .ca can do in the overall, from an overall perspective right here, is we run, I mean, basically we run two pieces of, uh, of the infrastructure here. We run the actual domain namespace, .ca, so if you get a .ca, we do that, so we make sure that it's safe, it's secure, you're the only one who has it, it can't get hijacked, all of that kind of stuff. And on the other side, what most people don't know us for as much is the DNS, which is the pure operations side. So we're the uh, authoritative traffic router of all those typed in requests or searches you do for anything that ends with a .ca, any domain name that ends with a .ca. 
and that is actually the biggest piece of what we do. And that's what creates the robust, resilient, trusted network that never goes down, that 100% uptime environment. And we do it in a way that not only do we have facilities across Canada, because the speed of light is fast, but geography does make a difference. So we run multiple nodes across Canada to make sure that we're taking care of all Canadians effectively. And we also run multiple nodes uh, in the rest of the world, international nodes. And that allows anybody doing searches or queries in the rest of the world to also get very fast performance out of .ca. But more and more importantly, to prevent attacks. Because those isolate attacks where the attacks are being generated. So we have a big Hong Kong node and attacks that are coming out of Asia Pacific get absorbed in that region and never actually impact Canada in the dot or the dot safe space in Canada. So it's that sort of bulletproof, 100% uptime, no fail infrastructure that's really the biggest part of what we do, though probably the least known part of what we do. All of that creates what I would say is the foundation or a key foundation part of the internet in Canada upon which everybody else can build their organization, their business, their digital footprint, whatever. And it's having, like, like anything you build, if you have that really robust foundation, which is .ca, then you know that you can build something even more incredible on top of it. And that's where I think CA really fits in the overall internet ecosystem. All right, there you go. Thank you, Byron. Okay, questions from the room again. Uh, put your hand up if there's a question from the room. We do have some more online. Okay, and uh, we'll go to some, uh, some more online. We do have a fellow who's got lots of questions about some stuff. One of the ones I like is this. Uh, we might want to extend it a bit more beyond the question, but the question is, how does the cloud affect the concept of sovereignty when information is being duplicated and shared globally? And that, of course, we could start going in all sorts of different policy directions uh, privacy information, which is that particular act is actually being reviewed right now but by Parliament. So let's talk about uh, the concept of sovereignty and uh, maybe Mark you want to start in here um, just because I know you're, you, you, I think you mentioned you have a project with Public Safety Canada at some point in time and as we project our sovereignty with ships and planes in the north or remote areas, so too with networks. Yep, absolutely. Uh, I mean one of the things, of course, is, is what control do you have over the network at the end of the day, right? And so one of the things we're doing is whatever the, we're sending to the satellite, we're downlinking close to the footprint of the satellite, which is a fairly small geographical area. Now, we will have issues at border areas like any satellite system. So imagine if you're transmitting your user, you're wanting to access the Internet in Windsor, then where does their signal come down on the Internet? Does it come down in Windsor or does it come out in Detroit? And so I think in the past, global satellite companies, what they've done is worked with local governments, in this case with the Canadian government, to find solutions by which you can meet the privacy and the lawful intercept and all the other requirements of the country by finding a solution by which you don't have to completely redesign your network. Uh, the cloud is, is somewhat similar in my mind, in the sense that you can either duplicate the information or you can, the countries can have rules and laws and, and regulations that says, well, Canadian data should stay in Canadian cloud sites and U.S. data can stay on the U.S. side. And so I think the, the private sector has to work with governments and, and to make it happen in a way that the governments will find you know, palatable for its public. Thank you. Great. I want to ask a question just to tie one of the themes today about uh, broadband and economic growth. So I'm going to put uh, kind of a couple of questions to Samer and Scott on this one. Samer, you, you, you've mentioned that you, some of your customers are going to be mining companies, resource companies. Can you give us some thoughts on uh, when there, there might be a development, there might be a business in the north that says, if you give me that service, I can do something and hire people and create new wealth and new resources. I mean, I'm assuming you're not building these just for the sake of them being built. You're building because stuff will get done if there's some, some networks in rural and, and northern Canada. Yeah, there's definitely uh, uh, an ongoing need uh, that we find every day. And, and sometimes the companies are not even aware of what is out there because, you know, they're, they're following the formula, you know, asking the one or two players that they know of, and you know, the, the, the solution that comes back is not uh, uh, dynamic enough or it's not uh, customizable enough for what, they're, what, what they want. And sometimes you do create a full ecosystem without even knowing it, right? Like I'll give an example. Uh, the, 
the, the railways, when, when they were first built the railways, uh, they, we didn't have a, a unified time zone, right? And the railroads are what created a unified time zone. That was a full byproduct of something that was just to transport goods back hundreds of years ago, right? So, um, so we're definitely finding that a lot. And, and just, uh, I was reading this a couple of days ago, um, Facebook and Microsoft teamed up to lay fiber uh, that connects the US or the Americas with Europe. And I mean, they're both software companies. So there's obviously a demand or shift in terms of, uh, you know, what I'm gonna refer to as like cross-marketing where you know, you're a software company, but now you're, dealing, you're doing something to benefit a third party or, or something else that could indirectly affect you. So, that's, so there's definitely uh, uh, room to, to do all sorts of stuff. And, and, and Scott, take us back maybe to the beginning days of QNET. Is QNET, did I get it right? Am I using the term right now? Okay, good. Um, the beginning days, or maybe now, I'm assuming Coquitlam has an economic development officer or office, and how does a network, your network make a difference when you're trying to attract new business investment or new residential development? I don't think that it's really the economic development uh, efforts of the city that, that led to QNET, to be honest with you. But, but know that QNET's now an asset when an economic development, is it? I don't know, you tell I me. I think what happened was there are various ways to uh, in, you know, uh, start up one of these things or to provide that spark. In our case, it was one person, it was Rick Adams. He was the IT manager at the time. And he understood that this was a good thing to do, not only for the IT uh, purposes of lowering telecom costs, but also as an economic development enabler. Because it's a pretty simple business model, right? It's giving that piece of the network that the incumbents are currently trying to keep from the, their competitors today and make it available. So it's a simple concept. And so it was one person, one visionary leader that talked council into the startup funds. Mm -hmm. Council of the day gets credit because they actually said, yeah, all right, here's the money, right? So that was pretty amazing. That's one way of doing it. The other way of doing it is to have an economic development group that actually uh, you know, looks at the data and sees the link and says, we need to do this. And there's another group out there called uh, Smart City, uh, Intelligent Community Forum. Has anyone heard of the Intelligent Community Forum? That's a good resource because you can go to them and they'll give you the checklist. These are the things that make you an intelligent community. And of course, you can feed into that, not just with fiber, but you can do it in a, in a variety of ways and, and you've probably got a, a whole bunch more examples. So you need, a, you need a visionary leader, you need someone that can build consensus, and you need an economic development uh, group that actually gets the connection between uh, the uh, railway, if you will, and the economic uh, enablement that comes from it. And maybe, Kelly, because you put your hand up there, and that might be a nice way to yeah. finish this, is connect next generation, all this great thinking with community development and some of the projects you guys can get involved with. Yeah, so I think, I think the term smart city, smart communities resonates with people and, and the more wider audience of citizens. Um, but the applications that can run in there across numerous platforms, right? Like I said, 5G, cyber, smart city. Um, the ICF organization I've actually worked in the past, I think Ottawa was number seven at one point a few years ago. We were the seventh smartest community. Um, but I guess if it's the last point, I guess the key takeaway, and I heard it from the panel before, is we're falling behind. We used to lead. Um, so how does the government incentivize some of these uh, innovations, right? So I just came back from Europe. When you put a shovel in the ground in Europe, in most all of the countries, fiber goes in, right? So it doesn't, it's just how it works there. Um, and mandating or incentivizing some of these activities in Canada, I think, would go a long way. Super. Well, thank you very much, panelists. Now, hold on a second. Stay here, because Chris Tassett had been sitting down there at the end of it, making notes of the whole thing. And uh, it's going to be Chris's uh, joyous task now to give us a couple of key takeaways. I'll let you take it away, Chris. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, it's a great honor to be here today. Uh, it's been a very interesting discussion. So as I was listening to all of this, I was wondering what are the themes that bind all of this together? Because we've had, we have four very distinct kinds of stories here and examples. And I tend to 
do a lot of my analysis through uh, an economic lens and, and think, what are the high-level principles that, that we should be advocating as a country? And one of the key challenges that we have as a country right now is improving our national productivity. Uh, if we want to be globally competitive, if we want to uh, develop our technology and, and be able to keep focusing more and more resources in that sector, this is something that we need to come to grips with as a nation. And it's a difficult thing to do. It's difficult politically because it's not that sexy to talk to the public about national productivity. People's eyes glaze over. So in a way, I'm very heartened by the discussion that the new government has started around the whole area of innovation because innovation is a key driver of productivity and in, in many ways is a code word for increased productivity. So now what can we do? Because we've heard these stories, I'm sure a lot of you didn't know the details of a lot of these stories. I've been in this space for 35 years and I've still, I'm still learning and there are things that these panelists said that I had no idea about. So one of the big challenges is, is leveraging. Uh, broadband is a lot like water. You know, uh, there are both private and public benefits to having clean water. Part of it is, yes, you get to wash yourself and you get to drink and you get to cook. But there are bigger public benefits. It, 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 it improves the health of the society, allowing it to be more productive and so on. And broadband is a lot like that. It's like electricity, it's like water. So there's a very big public interest in making sure that our broadband society and our ICT is well developed. So I see two critical areas, uh, I know people like three points, but I'll stick to two, uh, in which uh, we, could, we could be uh, doing better as a nation. And one is along the theme of discoverability of ICT, and what do I mean by that? There are a lot of people doing great things in this country and they're working in silos and nobody else knows about it. And nobody knows how to connect them together so that they can rely on each other and leverage each other's capabilities. We've heard a lot of great stories about HR and intellectual property capacity here, but how do we make that discoverable? And the thing that got me thinking about this is the CRTC in recent years has had a, uh, some big proceedings, one in the area of broadcasting, and one of the big themes that they had to deal with was, okay, how do we make Canadian content more discoverable? It's out there, but it's drowning because the more you put on the internet, the harder it is to find these gems. Uh, similarly, in the, in the recent basic services proceeding that the CRTC had, one of the issues that came out was, well, how do we make uh, you know, internet and broadband services of different types at different prices with different features discoverable? It's easy to think that you can just go on the internet and find everything, but as a business, if you're busy doing your own thing, it's actually quite a chore to do that research. And even as a consumer, to find out what the best deals are for yourself isn't always necessarily easy. So discoverability of ICT is, is a key issue, I think, for this country. And I think it's an area where government can lead. And, and we should be thinking about applying advanced AI technologies and other capacities as we go forward to make discoverability a, a key issue because I think it's going to drive innovation and productivity. And the second point uh, on which I, I will end is, is the, whole, the whole area of a national broadband strategy. Um, we're still at the point where there's still a considerable amount of fragmentation in, uh, in the way that we do policy. And there are some wonderful initiatives taking place. The, the, the new $500 million uh, broadband initiative from the federal government and the focus on transport, I think, is dead on. I think it's a great project. I think the CRTC's uh, recent BSO proceeding is, is a great attempt to, again, uh, make broadband accessible and affordable to everybody in the country, just like we want clean drinking water uh, accessible to everybody. We want to make sure people uh, don't suffer economically and socially because they don't have broadband access. So all of these things are good. Provinces and municipalities are doing their thing. Businesses are doing their things. But we need to find a way, and at, at the risk of eye-rolling of those who remember the constitutional debates of the 90s and, and before that, uh, we need to engage in some form of broadband federalism. Uh, I'm not sure what that would look like, but I think it's going to be very important to start that discourse and really 
get people together. You know, we have, we have highway projects now that are funded a third, a third, a third by the feds, the province, and the municipalities. Yet when it comes to broadband funding, although there are, there, there are some of those efforts, everybody tends to go it alone and does their own thing. Is that really the most efficient way that we can structure things if we look at it through the lens of productivity? And the lens of productivity is doing more with fewer resources. So we, we need to avoid duplication, but we also need to find those areas that are the most critical and apply the resources there. So those are the thoughts I'd like to leave you all with today. All right, thank you very much, Chris. And let's have a hand for our panel, Chris, Sam, or Mark, Scott, Kelly. Thank you.